The Jets are likely to be on hard knocks this year. It's time to get excited. It's not time to worry about distractions. We'll talk about it today on Locked On Jets. You are Locked On Jets. Your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome. This is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Thursday, June 29th, 2023, and I'm your host, John B. from gangreennation.com. Thanking you for making this show your first listen or first watch every day. Subscribe to the show for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so that you'll get new episodes as soon as they're posted. If you're listening to the show on a podcast source, please give it a five-star review. Or if you're watching on YouTube, give this episode a big thumbs up. These things help us out and help other Jets fans find the podcast. Today we have our weekly mailbag show. Each week we try and do a mailbag show on Wednesday. This week we're doing it on Thursday. Thanks to everybody who sent in questions. Our first question deals with hard knocks. John, this week reports came out that the Jets are expected to be the subject of hard knocks. Are you concerned about the potential for a distraction? So yeah, there were stories this week that the Jets are fully expecting to be the team to be picked for the HBO series Hard Knocks. It's a kind of a documentary on NFL teams. It gives you an inside look at training camp. And if you've been a Jets fan long enough, you may remember they were the subject of Hard Knocks back in 2010 with Rex Ryan, which many people believe was the most captivating season of the show. And the league can essentially allows teams to decline Hard Knocks, except in certain cases. If it's like if you've had a recent playoff appearance, you have the, op- the option to decline it. If you have a first-year coach, you have the option to decline it. So there are only like four teams that cannot decline the option, and one of them is the New York Jets. And with all the storylines around the New York Jets, they seem like far and away the most intriguing team if you were trying to build a documentary around training camp. And there is a lot of concern over this, and the articles came out this week that the Jets are fully expecting to be the team picked, which they likely will be, just because, again, they are the team with the most interesting storylines. So there's this talk, it's been kind of odd because... I can go back to 2012, the year the Jets got Tim Tebow, and there was some buzz that the Jets were going to be chosen for hard knocks that year as well. And ever since then, it's come up every couple of years. The Jets could be a team chosen for hard knocks. And the response within a portion of the fan base is always the same. Everybody's worried about it being a distraction. And I feel like part of that, we're in June right now. And this time of year, there's not a lot going on. So you have to come up with storylines. And I feel like some people in the media are kind of pushing the idea that Hard Knocks is going to be a distraction. I mean, I think if you're a fan, it's awesome. I'd, I'd want the Jets to be on Hard Knocks every year. I think it's really interesting to get an inside look at how your team is operating. And there are so many interesting storylines with the New York Jets. I mean, the obvious one's Aaron Rodgers, how he's going to come in and acclimate himself to this team. Um, Zach Wilson, I think if you're just looking at it from a storytelling perspective, the fact that Zach Wilson failed so fast and in such a profound way, yet is still on the team and trying to rebuild his career with a guy he really looked up to in Aaron Rodgers as the new starting quarterback. That's a really intriguing story. Uh, You know, a Jets team that has not made the playoffs since 2010, trying to finally get over that hump. And then you have the, you know, the standard hard knocks storylines, which undrafted free agents are they going to follow on their quest to make the team? Who is going to be the standout star of the, of hard knocks? You know, who's going to be the most quotable player? You have these basic things, but, I, I can't understand why anybody would not love for the Jets to be on hard knocks because you get an inside look at the way your favorite team functions. Uh, you really don't get that. You don't get to see that very often. And you know, as far as the idea that this is going to be a huge distraction, I mean, yeah, if you put camera crews around players, I, I understand that maybe they'll be distracted. These are professionals. They know how to work. And you know, the Jets are going to be a veteran team. This is going to be one of the oldest teams in the NFL. So you'll have guys who know how to be be professional, guys who will know how to work around camera crews. But a lot of this seems kind of academic to me. A lot of these concerns seem kind of out there. The Jets are in New York. They're always going to draw attention. You're always going to have the... I think one of the concerns is like something's going to come up on the show that's going to lead to a media frenzy. Well, I mean, if you didn't want a media frenzy, you shouldn't have traded for Aaron Rodgers. I mean, that's what it comes down to. 
the media in New York will always find a way to manufacture controversy. You don't need hard knocks to do this. Another thing that to consider, if you've read up on the show, the way it functions, the teams who are the subject of the series actually have a fair amount of editorial control. Uh, if you've, I've read some articles on this, that if you're the team that's on hard knocks, the league will show you what they're planning to do before they air the episode. And if you, you know, if there's something that's going to be really controversial, that's going to paint a player or a team in a bad light, or it's going to create undue controversy, the league is willing to work with the team. So, you know, don't worry about it from that sense. I, I think that so this is just a level of over analysis. I, I think there's a lot of over analysis with something like this. I think it, it, within our culture right now and our sports media culture, everybody has to have a take on everything. Every, everything like has to have either a positive or a negative impact on something. And you know, I'm, I'm talking about it right now. So I guess I'm part of the problem, but every, you have to always have to say either this is going to be good or this is going to be bad. I mean, is, is it going to impact the team's play at all? No. I think from the standpoint, you get to see your favorite team prepare for the season. It's really good. But I think as, as far as the team's performance goes, is it really going to impact things? No. I mean, if there was ever a team, I will say this, if there was ever a, a season of Hard Knocks where a team generated legitimate controversy, it was the 2010 New York Jets because that was show, that was quite a season. There was a lot of drama that was there during the Darrell Rivas holdouts. You had a lot of drama going on. You had Rex Ryan being a quote machine on that episode, uh, from episode to episode. And there, were, there you could say that that team, if there was ever a team that created distractions, it was the 2010 Jets. Well, guess what? That's the best Jets team in the last 25 years. That, that Jets team did more than any other Jets team since 1999. So if it's that big of a deal, it would have impacted the 2010 Jets. And... I'll take it a step further. Tell me the team who had its season derailed, and the reason it was derailed was something that happened on Hard Knocks. You can't. Let's be honest. By the time you're in week three, you don't really remember anything that happened in the preseason. Outside of maybe you know an injury that, that's keeping a player out. Short of that... We talk about, we, you know, and this goes with the offseason program, too. We spend all this time talking about what happened at this practice, what happened at training camp, what happened in a preseason game. And then once the real game start, nobody ever remembers what happened. So I don't, you know, if you look at do, player, do players and coaches like being on the show, it's a mixed bag. There are some coaches and some players who think it's great, who really enjoy it. There are some players and coaches who, you know, don't like having the camera crews around, who you know worry a little bit about about this stuff. But it's not like there's a consensus. It's not like there there is a unanimous view on this among in league circles. So it's very much a th- a, a, a matter of preference. And you know, at the end of the day, the league can make the Jets do this. The Jets are one of the few teams, because of the criteria the NFL sets out, that can be forced to do it. So you know what. As the article said this week, the Jets are preparing as though they're going to have to do it. And if they have to do it, then that's just something they'll have to work with. And I, I but I don't worry about it. I don't think it's really anything that's going to derail their season. I got to say something. If your season goes off the rails because of something that happens on an HBO show, odds are it was going to happen anyway. So I'm going to enjoy the fact that we're going to get to see how Aaron Rodgers interacts with his new teammates in the locker room. Going to enjoy. I mean, who's who's going to be the stand the new standout star? Will it be Sauce Gardner? Will it be somebody else? I think it's going to be very intriguing. Uh, so I, I think it's, it should be a great season of hard knocks that the Jets are on. I'm rooting for the Jets to get the show. I mean, this is not going to be a corner of the internet where people are where I'm going to panic over what happens on the show because I, I promise you, it's going to be really compelling. And you're going to, I think you're going to be really happy to see the way that the, the, the inner workings of the team. It certainly beats that that. Uh, YouTube series the Jets run out there, which is essentially, you know, if you followed that for the years, I think it's now called Flight 23. It used to be One Jets Drive. I mean, that, that was the series that, you, if you watched it, you'd think Adam Gase was going to reinvent offense in 2019 watching that. I'd like to actually see what's going on in the locker room, not like the Jets version of what's going on. So I think it'll be really captivating TV, and I think it's going to be I think it's going to be great. And I think if you're a fan, you should be very excited for the Jets to be on hard knocks if it happens. Now, head here on the Lockdown Jets podcast, we will continue this Weekly mailbag show, we're going to turn our attention to the sophomore class. Can this class of 2022 avoid the sophomore slump? I don't think you should worry about it so much, and we'll talk about it a little bit more as we continue this Thursday edition of the Locked On Jets podcast. Today's episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. 
We still have a couple months to go before the NFL season begins. The Jets are a few weeks away from the start of their training camp, although they do begin training camp a little bit early this year because they're playing an extra preseason game in Canton, Ohio, along the, uh, around the time of the Hall of Fame ceremonies. Once we get to September, though, you're going to want to put your money down to support the Jets. So that way, when the Jets win, you make money. And there's no better place to bet on the action than FanDuel. And that's because right now, new customers can get a no-sweat first bet of up to $2,500. That's $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. And if you don't want to wait for the NFL season, baseball's in full swing. And if you're a Yankee fan, you had to love what you saw last night in Oakland as Domingo Herman joined the likes of Don Larson, David Wells, and David Cohn as Yankees who have pitched perfect games. There's no better place to bet on all the sports action right now than America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get a no sweat first bet of up to $2,500. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Thank you so much for making Locked On Jet your first listener, first watch every day. We continue with our weekly mailbag show. Our next question, which rookie from last year is more is most likely to have a sophomore slump? All right, let's not think like that because there's nothing written in the NFL rules that the Jets need to have a player with a sophomore slump. So let's, let's go by this player by player. One of the things I like to do before the season is try and think, what it, what's the scenario where like everything goes right for the player? The best case scenario for the player and what's the worst case scenario for a player? Now, Sauce Gardner, it's, well, look, if there's going to be a sophomore slump, I would be f- shocked if it was Sauce Gardner. I, I don't think I've ever said this about a Jets player before after one season, but I really do believe this about Sauce Gardner. As long as he avoids serious injuries and as long as he you know, keeps his head on straight and as long as nothing crazy happens with him, I am really confident he's going to end up in the Hall of Fame. And I, I, I've never said that, said that about a Jets player after one year. I try and be very cautious about my expectations because I've seen careers take all sorts of trajectories. There are some guys who peak as rookies. There are some guys who become great, but you know, even if they're even if they have a big year, sometimes they take a step back in year two before really kicking their game into high gear in year three. But Sauce Gardner is just so great. I, I just I can't imagine him not being an elite level corner until his athleticism goes, unless something crazy happens or unless he has like some injury issues. He's going. I, I'll say it right now. I think he's going to end up in the Hall of Fame as long as nothing. Out, unexpected happen. So it's not going to be sauce. Garrett Wilson. So let's talk about Garrett Wilson, the best case scenario, the worst case scenario. The best case scenario for Garrett Wilson is Nathaniel Hackett utilizes him a little bit more in space. You know, he gives him some of those Elijah Moore, Braxton Berrios touches, maybe some handoffs, maybe some screens. Aaron Rodgers throws him some smoke passes when the defender gives him too much cushion. And Garrett Wilson's speed also is more of an impact deep. And he takes him takes himself from like 1,100 yards to like I don't know, 15, 1,600 yards, he becomes like one of the top 10 receivers in the NFL. That's like the best case scenario. The worst case scenario for Garrett is Aaron Rodgers is a quarterback who's known to take some time to build trust in a receiver. So if it doesn't click immediately with Garrett Wilson, maybe he's got some more trusted receivers on the team in Alan Lazard and Randall Cobb. Garrett doesn't get enough targets and maybe he falls back to like the 800, 900 yard range. Of course, the worst case scenario is you get injured, but we'll, we'll leave that out. So, you know, like it, I think it's conceivable for Garrett Wilson if if that's the case. But even then, we're not talking about like a Denzel Mims or an Elijah Moore drop. I mean, Garrett Wilson's shown that he's got a very high floor, so he you know he's going to be he's going to be a good starting receiver for a long time for this team. This isn't the case. I think like with Elijah Moore or Denzel Mims, the last two years, you kind of been trying to talk yourself into that first year because there was a context where you could argue that like Moore and Mims played well in year one. If, and if, in that there was a path for them to really become a quality receiver. Garrett Wilson's already a quality receiver. So I think even his sophomore slump would be better than what you've seen the last couple of years from the Jets receivers. Uh, Brees Hall, the boom scenario is he comes back and he's 100% healthy and he's as good as he was last year. And this, this year he doesn't suffer a catastrophic injury. The I don't know if you'd call it a sophomore slump, slump scenario, but it would be something along the lines of, you know, him not being 100% and him just kind of looking like a regular back. And maybe next year's the year he, where he's fully recovered. So I don't know if you'd call it a sophomore slump in that scenario, but I guess that's it for Brees Hall. And the rest of the guys, I feel like it's just kind of a failure to launch. Um, take Jermaine Johnson. I think the hope for Jermaine Johnson is probably he's going to be around like a seven to eight sack guy who plays the run really well. So and I think like for him at his age, because he was an older rookie, 
you're either going to see a click this year or you're not. I, I feel like there's no, that's one of those players where there's like no in between scenario. He's either going to be a good starter this year or it's probably not going to happen for him. Um, Jeremy Ruckert, if you want, want to go down the list, Jeremy Ruckert, there's a path for him to this boom scenario. I mean, there's a real path with only Conklin and Uzama in front of him for him to earn the starting tight end role and be a good kind of two way tight end, a guy who useful in the passing game, but a good blocker if he develops and, you, you know, becomes more consistent with his blocking technique. That's kind of the, the top scenario for Ruckert. And then, um, you know, you go down the list. Um, we could talk Michael Clemens. I think Michael Clemens is who he is. I think he's going to be a good rotational player. I think he's going to play inside. I think he's going to play outside on the defensive line. I, I, I guess the sophomore slump would be not, not being a useful rotational player. I think we've kind of seen what he is, though. I don't think he's going to be a star. I don't think he's going to be a great player. I think he's going to be a useful player, though, for the Jets. And then Max Mitchell, I feel like the boom scenarios, he gives them good depth at tackle. He gives them some insurance, which, which they need because of the age and health of the guys in front of him. And the bad scenario is just he doesn't develop. I think the good scenario is like he spends the he spent the offseason putting on some bulk that he's not going to get pushed around as much as he was last year, and that he develops quickly. And the you know the bust scenario for Max Mitchell is just that it never clicks for him, which is possible. I think a player in that in the fourth round where he was drafted, you know, it's probably more likely than not that he's not going to develop into anything. But really, what they need from Max Mitchell is for him to be a good backup tackle, and if he does that, then that pick is a, a win in my book. So. I think those are like this. Those are the expectations. Those are like the good and bad scenarios of all the Jets' 2022 draft picks. Next question: Would you rather have Denzel Mims or Stephen Hill? Well, Stephen Hill sadly was more has been more productive than Denzel Mims, and Mims has been around three years. Hill only lasted two. Hill had a couple big games. They were both in Hill's two years. His two greatest games were both the home game that season against Buffalo, where for whatever reason he had monster production. Both times they played Buffalo at home, and then practically did nothing the rest of the two seasons he was in the Jets uniform. However, I think, you know, part of the equ- fa- equation there is that the Jets really had no nobody at wide receiver. They had probably the worst group of receivers in the NFL when Stephen Hill was there. So I think if, De- if Denzel Mims was on those teams, he probably would have gotten more playing time and may have been more productive than Hill. I think in terms of skill set, Mims brings more to the table. I think Mims can win contested catches. I think he's got s- some strong hands. I think that he's tough to bring down after the catch. I mean, Hill really did not have any skills that were tangible to the football field. He could run the 40 fast in shorts, and he was tall. I mean, that's really all Stephen Hill brought to the table. Um, Mims, I, I, see, I think Mims still has some fans in this in, in, among the Jets fan base. I, I still think there are people, Mims believers in the Jets fan base. And that's because of like the skills I mentioned, because when Mims stands out he like really stands out like you really notice him the handful of plays he's made the problem is that they're few and far between and i think there are reasons there have been few and far between uh first of all he's just not that fast and i know like he ran a very fast forward that does not translate to the field i I'm, it just this is not a this is not a, it's maybe a guy who ran a 4 3 40 in shorts this is not a guy who's football fast so that's number one number two is i just think he has a lot of concentration lapses it shows them. It shows itself frequently where he's, you know, committing a penalty, dropping passes, line, getting lined up in the, in the wrong spot. He's also not a very good route runner. He's not that precise. I think Mims would need to go to an offense where he runs like a, he just plays the X position. He plays on the outside. He runs a very limited route tree that's based on vertical routes. And even then, I don't know that he's that great because I think his flaws really stand out. So I think like when people are optimistic on Mims, it's because like they see him really, really stand out because he makes a splash play. But the problem is he makes like a splash play once every six weeks, and he needs to do it more. I think his flaws prevent him from doing it. So I guess if you're asking me if I had to pick one, I'd pick Mims. But you know, it's not not nothing I feel all that strongly about because I don't think either of them are great receivers. I think Mims at best is probably like a backup, a number four receiver. Now Hill's not an NFL receiver at all. He wasn't, and he never was. So I guess I'd take Mims, but. You know, it's not exactly the easiest choice uh, out there. Now, head you on the Locked Dungeons podcast, we will close out our weekly mailbag. We'll talk about getting our first round picks signed on time. Why can't the Jets ever do it? We'll get into it a little, a little bit more as we continue this ed- Thursday edition of the Locked On Jets podcast. Welcome back to our weekly mailbag edition of the Locked On Jets podcast. Our next question, this is kind of a half joking and half serious question. Do the Jets have a bylaw hidden deep in their corporate charter that they are not allowed to sign first-round picks until after the beginning of training camp? 
I, for the life of me, cannot understand why they are always one of the last, if not the last, team to sign their picks every season. Oh, you and me both. Um, it's been one of the banes of my existence, the fact that the Jets have had such issues getting their first-round picks signed on time in training camp. Around this time of year, I you know, say, I'll tell you that I view this as like a basic competency test because there really is not much to negotiate in these rookie deals anymore. Ever since 2011, the collective bargaining agreement between the players and the owners that came out then, it took a lot of the drama out of contract negotiations. Yeah, every now and then there's a guy who plays hardball, whose agent plays hardball, but I think a lot of this is just like ego. The fact that there's like anything to negotiate, if you put if you put two people like like GMs and agents together and there's anything they can disagree on, their egos just get so big that like they turn these these minor issues into these enormous obstacles. Uh, but I think for the Jets it goes deeper than that. I mean, I think you have to look at this from an ownership perspective. And I say that because this has been ongoing. This happened with Mike McCagnan. It's happened with John Idzik when they could not sign D. Milner in time. It happened with Mike Tannenbaum. You know, that's, that was previous to 2011, but with Darrell Rivas. It's happened with Joe Douglas, both with... Uh, it happened with Zach Wilson back with Quinn and Williams. That was Mike McCagnan. So it just keeps happening over and over. And the issues are so small. The other thing I'll say about this is there's really, as a team, from a team perspective, there's nothing in any of these draft pick contracts that you should really just draw a hard line on. I don't think there's anything that's that's really worth keeping your first round pick out of training camp. I think teams make a big mistake when they, they play hardball in these negotiations because at the end of the day, you're getting a really good value for a first round pick. If your guy pans out, even if you give him everything that he wants, even if he asks for like everything out there, it still doesn't change the fact that these first round picks are not making that much money. They're not making star level money. So I don't really see what the point in doing this is. I mean, people always say, well, teams are going to see that they're going to, you know, agents will see that the Jets caved in some negotiation with a rookie and that they'll, they'll know that they can push the Jets around. No, they won't. The Jets can play hardball in the issues that deserve hardball treatment. You know, in free agency, you've got to be a little bit more careful. You have to be discerning. So, you know, if the Jets go to free agency and they go after a player, they can take a hard line then. That makes more sense instead of, you know, paying a mediocre player a ton of money like Mike McCagden did. That's where you draw the line. You don't draw the line with your first round pick because it's almost, it's kind of weird. It's as though, like you're saying, we just drafted this guy in the first round. We believed in him enough to draft him in the first round, but we're going to, we're going to play hardball over something very minor. So... The one thing I'll say for the Jets is last year they were very fast in getting their first round pick signed when they had three of them. Then they had an early uh, second round pick. So hopefully that's a sign that they're learning. I, I'm not going to go easy on the Jets, though. They need to get the, these picks in. They need to get these picks signed on time for training camp. So I'll give them the ben I shouldn't give them the benefit of the doubt because they failed too frequently of, of late. Getting these, getting their first round pick signed on time, but we'll, I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna panic until we get to a few days out. Even then, I won't panic because it's not like Will McDonald being missing a few days of training camp is gonna be the end of the world. But I'm gonna wait till we get a few days out before I criticize the Jets. But they do, really do need to get these picks signed in, in camp on time, and hopefully this year they will do it. Anyway, that's all for today's episode. This has been the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day is our motto. As always, if you enjoyed the show, hit the subscribe button where you're watching or listening so that you'll never miss an episode. Please give the show a five-star review if you're listening on a podcast source or a big thumbs up if you're watching on YouTube. Have a great Thursday, everybody. We'll be back next time to talk more Jets.